Hi guys, Sumber Lily Quinn here. And while I'm in social isolation, I decided that I was going to revise, relearn a tune that I've been playing for about 10 years. This is Black Orpheus. This is a Latin tune in the real book number one, if you're looking for that sheet music. And I played it with a trio back in Hawaii, and I've played it uh, as a duet with a friend of mine also back in Hawaii. And I got here and I thought, you know, I really should learn how to play this at a deeper level. So I was chatting on Facebook with uh, Ben Creighton Griffiths over in Wales, who's really a wonderful jazz harpist. And he said, hey, now that I'm at home too, I'm giving lessons. And I said, yay, let's do this. So we started in and um, this was the first jazz tune I ever learned on the harp way back in the day, and I was playing this on a Dusty Strings Allegro 26 with two sets of levers, C's and F's. So there was a ton of workarounds I had to do back then to make it work, and I absolutely could not play it as a solo because I didn't have enough hands to do all the lever changes, and I didn't have enough levers on that particular harp, so I had to do a lot of workarounds. But now I have this beautiful creature. This is a Lion and Healy. Uh, 85E from 2002, I think. And so um, I'm getting to play at a deeper level with the music. So I uh, started three weeks ago with Ben, and the first thing I did was I said, oh, let me play this for you. And he said, well, the first thing we need to do is get this a little, the rhythm a little bit tighter on the bossa nova bit. So uh, I'm all for exercises and, and doing it right. And so I sat down and I thought, I can do this. The left hand is a very simple left hand. The right hand is a syncopated right hand and I can play them independently, but I cannot play them together yet. It's kind of a mess. So I'm not even gonna demonstrate that for you right now. But I wanna show you the process that I'm working through to eventually get there. So, we talked about, Ben and I talked about chord voicings um, and and basically after I had um, thought it through, I came up with a couple of different solutions that I wanted to share with you. So the first thing I did was I wrote down all the chords that are in Black Orpheus and in a format like this. So these are all the chords that appear in the song. And then because Ben and I were working on rootless chords, that's why I have this marked this way. These are the notes that I'm gonna be playing around with as rootless chords. And as much as possible, we're using jazz extensions uh, on the upper ends. Um, here's a question mark because, oh, there's a lot of uh, lever changes. And is that note really important in the song? And so we've been talking about taking that out and and so forth so the very first thing i did was just literally write this out and figure out what notes i want to be in the voicings of the rootless chords that i'm going to be playing because the bass player or possibly my left hand if if i get it together will be playing these uh these root the roots of the chords here so I did that um, for a while and then a feeling like, this is, you know, this is okay, this is getting me started. But um, I really needed to see it written out. So then I started working in Sibelius and I started doing this kind of thing and I wrote it out. Um, and then as I worked through the chord voicings realized, oh, like here, I needed, I wanted to drop this G sharp from here down to the bottom because it made moving the hands uh, quieter, which you want when you're comping for jazz, you want to like barely move around. And so I started doing this. Um, also because I, I really wanted to see the exchange of hand, the rhythm, the rhythm in the hands between the left and the right hand. Um, so I could see what was happening here. And just so you know, I, it's difficult. I haven't figured out how to get Sibelius to give me a count in if I'm trying to play along with it. So these notes are just count in notes so that I know when to start playing here. So I did that for a while and then found, you know, it's sort of helping, but it's sort of not helping. Those cluster chords are hard to read. And so then I went on 
um, continuing to try to figure out the best way to practice these chords in the progression. So then I went to iRealPro. So let me share my screen with you and show you that piece here as well. So here's iRealPro. This is kind of the gold standard for jazz players, and there's a lot of um, other backing tracks. So this is a t this is a, a program that has backing tracks for thousands of songs. Literally, like if you look over here, almost 2,100 songs. These are mostly in jazz. There's like 1,351 jazz mm -hmm. jazz tunes, Brazilian tunes, Latin tunes, pop tunes, country tunes. And then these at the bottom are tunes that I'm working on, Take Five, Black Orpheus, and Nature Boy. And right here, I'll show you what I started doing for Black Orpheus. So while I was trying to figure out which uh, fingerings I wanted to use and which chords I wanted to use, I started creating uh, practice, um, practice uh, backing tracks that just were one chord at a time. So this will sound like this. Oops. Oh wait, I can't hear that. <laughs> to figure out how to, I'll share that with you in a second. Um, and in fact, um, if anybody wants these backing tracks, just contact me and I can send them to you. So these are the back, here, so here's a backing track for this chord, for this chord, for this chord, for this chord. These are all the chords. There's 11 chords in, um, uh, in, Black Orpheus, and so I made practice tracks for each one of them, and then you can make them go as you know, run as long as you want. I have it down here for 10 repeats, so it's actually 20 measures of each, so that I really get to know the uh, the notes that I'm using for the rootless chords, and then the inversions of those notes, so that I can play them in different places on the harp. So after I did that for a while, I realized that there is really no way for uh, iReal Pro to advance automatically from one chord to the next or from one song to the next. You literally have to click on each one to make them come up to play. So then I created this. This is all, again, all the chords in Black Orpheus um, all the way through. This They're not in they're not in order, it's just the chords that are involved in the tune. And then, um, so, and then each one I had set up to play uh, eight times or 16 measures of each again, so that I can learn the hand positions, the inversions, and still working on the timing of the, um, the right hand, right hand rhythms of the bossa nova. And then, so I did that with eight and then, I now I'm trying to make it faster to so changes faster for myself. So this is four. And then this is although this does this looks a little bit different. This is two. And now I have written the chords in order as they appear in Black Orpheus. But again, it's not the actual timing of the tune. It's so that I can play this chord for four measures and this chord for four measures and this chord for four measures and this chord for four. So that I can again working my way towards. Uh, getting them into the into the song in the right timing. So this is not the right timing. This is the right order. However, this is the order that, that the chords appear in. So I started working my way through that. And then I realized, um, because I was having, and this is where I am right now, I'm having trouble, uh, maybe not trouble, but I just haven't worked it out yet of um, getting from this chord, the E7 flat nine, back to the A minor, that's not so bad, but then, because that happens a lot here, the A minor nine, which we put in as an extension to the B minor uh, seven flat five to the E7 flat nine, this uh, trio of chords appears together in this song a lot. It's also here, here, and here. And so then getting, um, what I'm working on now is getting smoothly from here to here to here to here and so forth. Um, so that, I thought, as I've thought all along, I can just wing this. I'll just figure it out as I go along. Uh, but in fact, that didn't work very well. And so now we're kind of getting caught up to real time. Um, I'll stop sharing this now back to me. Um, 
to show you then now what I'm doing is I went, this looks very similar to my first page of chords, uh, rootless chords, but now this is the, these are all the chords in order as they appear in the song. And this is the first page. There's a second page. Yeah, oh, no. that I've done. Um, so I exploded out the first page that, you, that I showed you a minute ago that just had one of each of the chords and this now shows them all uh, in the order that they appear in the song with the voicings that I have chosen um, with Ben's help. So now and then, so this, these are the voicings of the chords. So here's the root, the third, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, if there's a, a ninth. Um, I again kind of decided that these notes weren't so important, so I took them out. And then over here, this is what I just started last night. I'm starting to put voicings in order, uh, kind of a basic position that I can always return to so that the the root note, I should so, okay, so the, the bottom note, not the root note, but the bottom note of the voicing is all pretty close together. So here we have G's and A's, G's and A's, G's and A's. Uh, hop up to a B here for this, but I could probably move that A back down there and make that um, closer to this one. And I probably will go ahead and do that um, when I'm done talking with you guys. Same thing here. And then um, go back and you know, literally like note by note, hand position by hand position, make sure that each one of them is correct because I have uh, definitely made some mistakes in my voicings um, in the extensions because it's more or less familiar to me. So I'm still learning exactly which notes go where, but also, um, yeah, it's, and then the inversions of those different chords because it, when I get into the soloing part of this, when I've kind of got the comping under control, then when I get into the soloing, I want to be able to solo on those chords and know where those inversions are in the upper part of the um, upper part of the harp. So that's kind of where I am. I wanted to also share with you one last thing. Um, let's see, just one second. There we go. I want to share this with you. So I want to share this video. I won't play it because they'll take it down. They'll, YouTube will take it down. But I want to. I'll put, post the link to this young man in my um, in the in the underneath this in the text of the of the uh, video that I make this video that I'm making. Blah, 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 blah. And he just does a wonderful job of playing the whole thing as a solo. It's gorgeous, and I've been practicing with him for years. And uh, really, Hervé Olivetti, I'm not even sure where he's from, but I really like his playing, and I wanted you to know about him. So that is where I am with Black Orpheus right now, is at the point where I am, I've now written out all the chords in the, in the root in the rootless chords that I want to use <clears throat> just from spelling the chord out from the root up and then here rearranging these notes into something that is a better comping pattern so that my hands are uh, not moving around too much and also it has been reminds me and, and other jazz players that I've played with over the years remind me that on the harp you know the melody section is going to be mostly higher up and the bass section where I've got my yarn, I'll talk about that in a second, is you know where the bass player plays. And so you want to stay out of the bass player's way. You want to stay out of the melody player's way. And so that leaves you this to play in. It's the, you know, about an octave and a half here in the middle. And so you got to make it all happen within that, um, within that geography of the harp. And um, yeah, and then the, the string here, this is, I'm a knitter as well as a harpist. And so the yarn here on the, on the bass strings uh, reminds me to stay out of the bass, but also dampens the strings because they can get kind of boomy. And um, 
and that's not great in jazz. That's it, you know, it can take over and build up this wall of sound that's really unpleasant and and uh, runs over the rest of the players. So careful not to do that. So that's where I am with uh, Black learning Black Orpheus right now. And when I have a little, have this a little more under control, then I'll do some demonstrations for you and, and play a little bit of that for you. So I hope those, uh, this was helpful. Again, the, you can find the sheet music in the iReal book number one, page 49. And um, lots of people played this tune. Um, I will say that when I first learned, this was the first tune I ever learned. This is the first jazz tune I ever learned. I had no idea at the time, which was probably good, that this was one of the harder, ter ter harder tunes. Um, and then when I started learning other jazz tunes, I thought this, these other tunes are like, don't have massive <laughs> chord changes. Are they all like this? What is going on? And uh, gradually realized that, um, they're just, you know, there's lots of wonderful jazz tunes with just a couple of short chord changes. And then there's a lot of wonderful jazz tunes that look like this. And I had no idea when I started, which was, as I say, probably a good, a good thing. And now um, is one of my, one of my spiritual teachers says to me frequently, never be afraid to go back to the beginning. Never be afraid to start over again because you're never starting in the same place. You're always starting with more experience. You're starting with more knowledge. And in this case, I happen to be also restarting all of this with a fantastic teacher who's really giving me a lot of good direction. So that's my, that's where I am on Black Orpheus right now. And as things progress, and I feel a little more ready to share actual playing with you, uh, I will, I will. So I look forward to your comments and hope to hear from all of you out there soon.